Welcome to Catalyzing Innovations podcast series, where exceptional global innovators across sectors share best practices to maximize creativity and practical secrets for good implementation. Hi, everyone. It's Michelle Greenwald, host of Catalyzing Innovation podcast, and I'm here today with Maria Vorovich, co-founder and chief strategy officer for GoodQuest and Holland Martini, Chief Insights Officer at GoodQuest. They're a new type of consumer insights agency that calls themselves anti-research research company. So I'd just love you guys to both introduce yourselves and tell a little bit about your backgrounds and what led you to start the company. How did your background prepare you to give you the foundation for what you're now giving back to clients? Yeah, um, I can start. Mine's a little bit more obvious. So I'm Holland, again, I'm the Chief Insights Officer and co-founder of GoodQuest. And my background is really in research through and through. So my entire career was in research. I actually started research um, when marketing mix modeling was first a thing. Um, so innovation there, which is now considered somewhat old school, only 15 years later, it's, it's moving at the speed of light. Um, and I think, you know, I was lucky enough to start my career at a time when data was really taking off. And so I've really seen quote unquote innovation um, from the, the days of when companies started first trying to get big data into brands, right? It just wasn't a thing. Um, and so, you know, I've been following that trend and now every company has data across the board. And, you know, for me, what really got me excited about starting Good Quest and really focusing on research is not how much data can you get, but what data is best and why is that data good for your business? Um, and, and sort of my build on that, and I'm Maria, I'm, I'm the chief strategy officer at GoodQuest, and I'm the complete opposite of Holland. Um, I had absolutely virtually no experience as a researcher when I co-founded the company, um, but where I did have experiences as a brand builder. Um, and what that meant was that I was buying research. So I was buying research from the Ipsos, from the Cantars, um, and I was building, positioning, repositioning brands like 3-1 Philip Lim, uh, brands within the Procter & Gamble portfolio, brands within the Marriott portfolio and I saw firsthand the power of really, really good consumer insights and how that could impact the business. Um, but what's really interesting is that good insights were very far and few in between. Um, so all of these companies were data rich but insights poor. Um, and so when Holland and I got together it felt like the perfect marriage in the sense that I have this sort of vision of what a brand needs to be smarter, the kind of insights that need to come forth, um, and ideas of how to do that from a creative perspective, because I was um, the chief strategy officer for creative brands and um, brand manager for other brands. So essentially, you know, seeing the tools that you need, and, and Holland had the, the vision, the brains, the capability to sort of help me bring that to life, which was really exciting for both of us. That's really, that's awesome. It's a great balance and a great two different perspectives that clients really, really need and that you can empathize with clients because you've been one. So can you explain, it's, it's kind of intriguing that you call yourself an anti-research research company and what is the anti-research part and uh, like how did you come up with that idea? Absolutely. So, I, you know, the truth is, and I think it's important to call a spade a spade, is that our underpinning is that of a traditional research company in the sense that we conduct qualitative and quantitative research. The interesting part is that we're innovating everything around it. And what do I mean by that? So if you think about research, there are two polarities. There's the respondent part, right, the research participant, and there's the client part, which is our brands. And the way that we like to talk about it is we humanize it on both sides of the equation. So that means that we're thinking about the research experience in a way that no other company is doing it. So literally the incentive for our research participants is how do you make it feel like an intimate conversation versus an interrogation? Even if it's a survey, how do you make it feel like a TikTok and like something fun versus something that you're doing for five minutes of your day for a $5 gift card? And on the flip side of that, for brands, how do you make research something that they look forward to? Um, the brief that we give our internal team is make this research read like a steamy novel. And if it doesn't, it's not going to be used. Um, and I love to give this example to really sort of bring to life what it is that we're doing. So for a very long time, if you think about the research industry, say you needed to carry items on the go. The research industry told you, well, you do that with a plastic bag. What we've come and we've said, 
what if it's not made out of plastic? What if it's neoprene? Or what if it's denim? Or what if it's leather? So we've changed the input, the material. And then we said, what if it's not so functional? What if it's not just being used to carry things? But what if it's beautiful? What if it's something you look forward to carrying? What if it's something that you show off? And that's how we think about our research. It's not functional, it's emotional. Yeah, and just from like a very simplistic way and, and you know, kind of bucking a stereotype that I think has been long associated with research is long boring decks equals rigor and and that's kind of you know how it's always been and you know oftentimes when you see creative you just assume that it's at the expense of the rigor and that's kind of where we're the, the anti-research research company right so we are as maria said doing those foundational rigorous inputs it's just the output is beautiful and exciting to read and that doesn't mean it wasn't you know done in a statistically significant way it doesn't mean it's not backed by statistical theories it just means that you're excited to read it. No, that's super cool. So do you brainstorm making the research fun um, and making the presentations fun? So, and you customize everything, I imagine, for different clients because the, also the consumers are different. So can you just talk a little bit about what the process is of making research fun and then making the presentations fun? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from a research perspective, I think what's exciting is that you know, we, we operate like a creative agency in the sense that when we get an RFP, um, a request for proposal, right, we actually bring together the team and we almost have a creative workshop on what is the most interesting way mm. to approach this solution depending on the client, right? Um, you know, how can we get exciting? What are those principles of psychology that we can pull in? Um, so for example, if, you know, one company we're working with really just has a bad reputation, quite frankly, right? And um, a lot of people might not want to be associated with that company. Um, so one method of psychology that we use is actually what we call, what would your neighbor say? And it's really just a methodology of, you know, who do you think your neighbor would would vote for, right? What do you think your neighbor would think about this company? I'm not sure if you heard about this, but it's the only pollster that actually predicted Trump would win in the election is when you ask people what your neighbor thought about it. Because inherently what it does is it, it naturally makes you not feel judged in your mm -hmm. responses. Yeah. So that was one creative input, right? And then from an output perspective, we also brief designers on what the research should look like when it's it's delivered. So we had a car company and the entire deck was literally like you were driving down the road behind a steering wheel and that's how you were getting the insights. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. I've heard of research companies that hire copywriters, which is something I don't particularly care for because it's not the people who have done the research, but I haven't had thought, um, them use designers, which I think is really, really fun. So do you find that because you talked about that historically rigor was a huge deck, which people, they walk away and there's too many things to remember and they really, they can't narrow it down. But do you find that they think fun, they can't associate fun with profound? Like, do you, or do you find um, they're able to appreciate, yeah? Absolutely, I think that's a truth, but I think um, the smartest companies in the world right now are debunking that myth, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we think about, um, I mean, let's think about Tesla, right? There's nothing more serious than energy efficient cars, but Elon Musk has made it humorous. Um, if we think about the names of each of the cars, uh, I don't know if you know this, but it Model S, Model E, Model X, Model Y, it spells out sexy. Um, and that's how he designed oh, it. That's great. That's um, great. I so, love it. So it's an example of, you know, you take a really serious subject, but again, you, you bring to the forefront the humanity. And as people, we're emotional creatures. We want to be engaged. Um, why wouldn't you make every part of your life fun and engaging? Um, because, you know, you have one life to live. We might as well make it really exciting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even if it's data. Yeah. No, I, I started a program that's sort of like hard to do right now because of still COVID, but I would take people to different countries to benchmark leading innovators and go visit them in their workshops, studios, labs. And it was just really fun. Get people out of the office, out of their sector, and just see that they can you know, get new ideas. And in a way, it feels like going on a vacation and how can you be coming up with big insights? But you need to get away from your day-to-day -to, -day to really have the big insights because otherwise you're just doing the same stuff over and over again. So, but getting people past the feeling guilty for doing this kind of a thing, I know is kind, is kind of a challenge. But I imagine you have great word of mouth because once they've experienced it, it's just a much more fun way of working. Um, okay, so how have, can you just talk a little bit more about um, the problems that you saw clients have and how, like the insights, how you come up with different insights as a result of your approach? 
Me? Okay, yeah. I'll take this one. Um, so the problems are really um, quite obvious, and our clients aren't shy to talk to us about them. So um, PepsiCo is one of our largest clients, and what we've heard from them quite often is that two things that they're doing. One, they're receiving the research reports and then they're redesigning them internally before they share them with the other teams, which is insane. I mean, research reports mm. are quite expensive. So mm -hmm. to have to have another workflow when you get it is mm. mind blowing. Mm. That's number one. Number two, and we've heard this not just from PepsiCo, but from many, many clients, from TikTok, from Meta, from others, yes. that they take the research report, this 100 page dense monstrosity, and then they deduce it to you know the three things that they find interesting, and again they edit back and then recirculate it against the organization. So, mm -hmm. you know when we hear this, we see a white space, and um, mm -hmm. we can fill that gap, we can bridge it, and that's exactly what we do. And um, so you know the kind of insights that come out of that are really really interesting, and and it's not just the insight; it's the the use case. It's the fact that we want nothing more than for data to be more actionable and more uh, utilized and by again you know taking our own sort of flavor of it that's what we're doing we're making it less of a chore and more of an asset so just storytelling with data so many people are talking about that and how are you well you talked about brainstorming and use the example of getting behind a car or, or there's a dashboard or whatever but how do you um, story tell with data? A part of it, I had a speaker from Twitter in one of my classes, and it was interesting because she, Twitter has started uh, departments within it that work with clients to interpret all the data as well. And they're, they're very selective about what they show to clients. There's a certain filtration process because there is so much data. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they do it in a really fun way based on the audience because there can be lots of different audiences and you might have to show the data in different ways for that audience. So can you talk a little bit about how you empathize with like how the audience's perspective, um, what they need to hear to really understand, digest, and act upon things, and how you kind of customize for audiences. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, one thing to start off is it matters so much on your, who your audience is. So when we kick off every project, we don't just take the brief and run for it. We ask them, like, really, who will this inform across the board? You might think it's marketing, but is it UX? Is it your leadership? Like, is it product innovation? And we think about that output across the board. Um, I used to jokingly say, I. I did my work best if you couldn't tell I was there because I'm like the analyst in the group, right? And I speak a totally different language. Mm. So I think, you know, good data storytelling is when you can start speaking the same language as your audience. And, you know, this is, this is quite provocative and Maria and I talk about this a lot, but I think it hasn't completely filtrated the world because there's still so many silos within an organization, right? There's the research silo, the consumer insight silo, the marketing silo, et cetera. And everyone's fighting to get their voice. Our voice is numbers, right? So we're obsessed with putting charts in front of people because we want credit for our work. Um, and so, you know, at GoodQuest, we don't have those silos. We partner every strategist directly with a researcher. And because of that, no one's struggling to get their voice heard. And so you can tell that data, not through a number, but through a story. And that removal of the ego really allows that insight to come through and come through in a really interesting way. So if you go the next step, when the clients, they absorb the information, they kind of process it, and then they act, like, can you tell that they're doing things differently, that they're receiving the information differently, and I don't know, maybe they're more excited, they're more, like, thinking and more broadly, like, how, how would you describe kind of the end product of what you're doing with your clients? Absolutely, and, and you know, the truth is, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I'll say it anyway. So one of our clients is, uh, is Jägermeister, and we do everything from them, you know, from foundational research in terms of who their audience is, to concept testing, to campaign testing. Um, and something that they said to us recently is they said, you are the only research company whose work even the Germans get. <laughs> and they had us present. And why is that? It's, it's just, you know, actually, you know, I don't want to make it up. I have no idea why that is. I didn't, I didn't go as far as to ask, you know, why, why don't your superiors yeah. get it? Yeah. <laughs> but what I will say is that that's such a moment of pride for us in the sense that we are breaking those language barriers, as Holland is saying. We are making research palpable for mm -hmm. everyone, mm -hmm. not just the data scientists in the organization. But if you're marketing, if you're UX, if you're creative, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, you know, you look forward to receiving the research. And I think to, we'll give a few examples as well. One off the top of my head is um, 
for PepsiCo again, uh, you know, we did a study about chip incidents and we delivered the entire report from the perspective of a chip. So the chip was telling the story. So it almost again feels like a storybook. It's so fun. It's such a little twist of, of the narrative, but um, you're able to play with different language, with different storytelling, with more context, with more adjectives as a way that you cannot if you're just simply a research company. So it sounds like there are a lot, lot of visuals in this. The part of the process is, as you talked about, not having a deck with tons and tons of words, but really thinking of analogies and making them come to life. Exactly. Analogies, data visualization, again, such a buzzword, but so yeah. big. So oftentimes clients don't even realize they're looking at a chart. They think they're just looking at an animation, but it really is a chart Con with all of the data behind it. It just comes across as a beautiful visual. Um, and you know, like you were saying before, how can you tell that this is you know really working within an organization? I think a KPI that I've really identified is that normally you deliver a research report and that's it. We get so many follow-ups of, can you deliver it to this team now? Can you deliver it to this team now? Can you deliver it to this team now? And that breaking down of the internal organization and infrastructure so that everyone is looking at the research and it's not just silos and it's truly infiltrating, not only just shows that our work is doing well, but whoever you know brings us on board, the ROI for them goes up sure. um, because it's infiltrating multiple aspects of the business. Sure, and then they look good, which is a great thing. So how have you evolved your approach over time? Because um, how many years have you been so far working in, in your company? When did you found it? Yeah, we're going on five years. Five years, wow. So have you seen your clients evolve, the environment evolve? I know, I think it's much more common now for people to be talking about big data visualization and storytelling with data and all that stuff. So I don't know if you're, you're becoming more, you know, as unique as you were or if you're trying to stay ahead of the curve and if there's evolution to, you know, my next, I want to ask that question, but my next question is going to be where do you see it going? So how have you evolved from when you started and then where do you see it going forward? There's so much discussion of the metaverse and, you know, maybe there's m research in the metaverse, but are there, AI is coming into play a lot. So like basically what has been the evolution so far for you and then for your clients in the industry and where do you see things going? Yeah, I can. I mean, I can at least talk to kind of the AI and the capabilities behind it. And I'd love to tar talk, turn it back to Maria over the evolution in general. But, you know, I think there's constant technology and, you know, services coming into the research space. Um, but I think a huge emphasis, which is quite interesting, is on this the SaaS model. Um, and so a really big focus on the technology brands doing it themselves and really just making it quick and fast and insightful. Um, where I think, you know, where we're really focusing on is let's not always just do it fast. <laughs> um, let's really focus on the connection. Let's not sell a technology. Let's sell an insight. Um, and so, you know, I think while the, you know, the industry is going one way with SaaS, we're kind of bucking the trend by going back to service. Um, and then when it, when it comes to AI and metaverse, that's always a fun one. We're actually doing a ton of research around the metaverse um, and what the metaverse, quite frankly, even is. I think research in the metaverse is next. I think AI is it's really just a way to mitigate bias. Again, very provocative for an analyst uh, to say, but I also think it, it's coding biased as well. Um, so I think as, you know, as much technology is entering the space, more kind of service and focus on humanity is going to need to balance that in order to like, again, really be consumer centric. We talk about it all the time. We say consumer centric, we say human centric, but then we don't really think about the people we're talking to as humans. We're just trying to robotify it all, if you will. I don't think that's a word, but, um, and that's kind of where industry's going one way. We're kind of bucking the trend into another direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think to build on what Holland is saying, I think the goal of that, why the industry is going towards SaaS is that they're following the money. And I think that in our society, we've seen what happens if you pursue profit over people. And I think we're literally doing the opposite of that. And we focused a lot of this discussion on outputs, but I think it's worth saying how much we're innovating on inputs into the research. So, and to your point about how are you evolving, we're constantly testing new hypotheses to connect with respondents better. So one example of that is we've recently started introducing meditation into uh, as a 
as a sort of prelude to survey taking. So we don't even call it meditation um, because we don't want people to kind of respond to that word because it carries a lot of different connotation. But what we'll do is we'll have a guided one minute breathing exercise that people will do. And what we've seen is we've done A-B testing of doing a survey with meditation and without, and people report 50% more thoughtfulness in their responses. Wow. That is massive. That's and for very a, interesting. For our brands, for the AB InBevs of the yeah. world, for the PepsiCos, for the Metas, for the TikToks, if they're paying big money for research, should you go the SaaS model, which is fast and quick and dirty, or is it worth every once in a while to do this kind of thing where you're really connecting with people and you know trying to really understand them um, in ways that are really quite unique? No, that's super interesting. So are there any other unique things that you're doing that are just kind of fun that you feel like sharing? Because I love that. That was a great example. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many. Um, you know, from gamifying, we, we did a drinking game once. We played Never Have I Ever with our respondents for one of our spirits companies. So if you've ever played Never Have I Ever, you know, you admit the darnest things you know I can't say in a podcast the kind of things you probably admit <laughs> but when you're playing a game with respondents they let their guard down they no longer feel that you know oh you're judging them you're quantifying their behavior they're playing with you um, there's obviously you know full transparency that we're a research company all of that but on the flip side we're collecting really really interesting insight about their behavior yeah. um, that's one example um, another example of something we do and I really think this is quite revolutionary for the space in qualitative work where you do you know typical focus group or an in-depth discussion it's typically like an interrogation even the two-way mirrors there right mm -hmm. you, you imagine you're watching someone it feels like a detective's like leaning over you trying to get to you know what do you actually do and what we found is if we cast moderators the way you would cast an actor oh, for a movie role that's very interesting yeah that people are more likely to respond so moms open up to other moms if you start the conversation that way developers hate talking to other developers who are experts because they feel intimidated and they feel that they have to posture. So they want to talk to novices. So we'll get grad students to talk to them and to moderate. That's super interesting. Um, so I mean, yeah. the sky is the limit when you think about how do you change the experience for right. people participating. Right. right. So in terms of the, the information that you get, because you're making people more relaxed, they're having more fun when they're just giving you the information, do you find that they're giving different types of information? like? more honest, deeper, how would you describe like the, what you're getting compared to a more boring, usual type of tactic? Yeah, yeah, we've actually researched this, um, research within research inception. <laughs> um, but what we did is we looked at, you know, what that kind of output it t turns into, right? When you use methods of psychology, when you copyright the questions, when we use kind of, you know, that meditation, what happens? And we actually found that we find 2.2 times the length of survey respondents responses in qualitative which you know Maria always says it's literally more for your money right and it's so they're giving open-ended responses and they're just doubling blabbing on yeah. blabbing on yeah. and on and on yeah. that's very interesting yeah um yeah and then even you know from a quantitative perspective we found that we see 20 percent less of the i don't know or mm. um none of the above right because again people are naturally engaged and, and they're just they want, they're being thoughtful. They want to provide the answers. Um, it's very human. I think, you know, we emulate, in order to connect, we emulate how others speak. So when you're talking to a baby, you emulate a baby to connect with them. When you're speaking to someone who's being very formal and very polite with you, you emulate that to mm -hmm. be, to be respectful. When research is robotic, and flat, you yeah. emulate that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, frankly, I don't know how the industry hasn't ca caught on. I feel like we've hit this gold mine and I can't believe, you know, yeah. <laughs> that it, it was waiting for us. That's super interesting. <laughs> very, very interesting. And anything like with the stimuli, in a way, I guess gamification is stimuli. The meditation maybe doesn't really deal with that aspect of it, but are, are there creative stimuli that you give to expand people's minds or mm. is that a part of it? I mean, you know, not always. Yeah. I will say that, you know, sometimes like the gamification does include quite, quite picture, quite frankly, pictures in the background, right? Mm -hmm. That just like get you into the mindset of the category you're in or the brand that we want to learn about. Um, and, you know, that's kind of where it stops. But it, it's really interesting to think about that, right? How different people respond to different images and, mm -hmm. and how that makes them feel. Um, there's actually a very interesting psychology, psychological study about how 
people all feel the same things, but um, they express their emotions quite differently. And so, you know, you look at other cultures and, you know, this is a stereotype, but it's, it's part of the research. You know, in Japan, people are not emotive. Mm -hmm. They just don't express the emotion. Mm -hmm. um, and there are certain images that you can actually show people of different cultures that actually cause them to express because that's culturally acceptable to express to that type of image. So something for us to look into. Yeah, yeah. And then what about your team? Or I'm, I'm guessing that there's creativity in the team that you put together and the type of people that want to work with you guys. So, Absolutely. Yeah. We're really creative when we hire as well. You know, I think me not having a formal background, what we're really keen to do is, is mix the formal backgrounds with informal backgrounds. So um, we've hired comedians before. Oh, wow. Um, That's we've, interesting. You know, we've hired people who are artists on the side. Um, mm -hmm. One of our, she's a project manager, but she contributes to a lot of the creative sort of bursts and sparks. She actually, um, she does a lot of sculpture, right? So it's people who have capacity f to think outside the box mixed with the people who mm -hmm. know the analytic rigor and when you can do that and you can all be on the same team yeah it creates magic yeah 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 and then do you have in-house artists that um and designers who yeah yeah mm -hmm. that's awesome yeah that's great no that's so much fun what you're doing i love it and i can see how it would be very popular because i think clients probably have so much fun with it and it makes a lot of sense yeah. so that that's awesome well thank you guys very very much and if people want to get in touch with you what's the best way to do that it's always the easiest is the website www.goodquest.com it's good quest like good question so it's very easy to remember and to find right and no tea at the end no tea no at, tea the, at end. the end <laughs> very good okay well thank you so much